Welcome to Literary Insights. This is the summary of the book How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, An Unexpected Guide to Human Nature and Happiness, Russ Roberts. If you like this content, please consider subscribing and liking this video. Adam Smith was an 18th century Scottish philosopher and economist best known for the wealth of nations. He also wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments which explores morality, ethics, and human nature. Smith lived an outwardly uneventful life. Little is known about his inner life as he burned most of his private papers. The theory of moral sentiments went through six editions in his lifetime as Smith continually revised and improved the work. The theory of moral sentiments addresses human motivation, morality, and achieving happiness and self-knowledge. Though challenging to read today, its themes are timeless. It connects morality and economics by exploring human nature, choices, and behavior. Smith observes that human nature involves a tension between self-interest and moral concern for others. We care more about ourselves yet hold moral principles against harming others for our benefit. Reconciling this is a key question of ethics. Smith argues we often act morally not due to compassion but to gain approval from an imagined, impartial spectator. This counters self-love and spurs us to standards of honor, nobility, and superiority. Even alone, imagining the spectator's judgment leads to morality. The impartial spectator gives us a tool for self-improvement by seeing ourselves through others' eyes. This fosters understanding ourselves and how we can improve. Mindfulness, paying close attention to your actions, can make you a better person by recognizing your self-centeredness. Imagining impartial spectators can make you less self-centered, react less angrily, be a better friend slash boss slash parent, and find happiness by clarifying what really matters. Smith believes happiness comes from deserving love and praise by cultivating integrity and skill. We should not seek love without being lovely. The happiest life deserves the admiration of others. Our desire to be loved makes us prone to manipulative flattery. Believing undeserved praise is hardest to detect in ourselves due to self-deception. Our selfish passions override our conscience, and we make excuses to maintain our sense of loveliness. Detecting false praise requires honesty with ourselves about our moral failings. Adam Smith argued that humans have a powerful tendency toward self-deception and self-love. We want to see ourselves in an admirable light, so we avoid recognizing our own flaws and imperfections. This desire to think well of ourselves leads us to justify selfish actions in selfless terms and engage in strange logical inversions. We convince ourselves that we are acting for the benefit of others when really we are acting for ourselves. While some self-deception may be adaptive, too much of it prevents moral progress by obscuring the need for self-improvement. The path to wisdom requires overcoming the self-deception produced by self-love. Recognizing our own faults and limitations can be emotionally painful, so we avoid situations that would force us to do so. But we can use observations of others' imperfections as reminders to examine our own behavior. Smith argues that true happiness comes not from ambition, fame, and fortune but from strong relationships, life's simple pleasures, and living in the present moment. However, human nature also includes a drive for more, more money, success, novelty, and status. This drive, when taken to an extreme, prevents us from enjoying what we already have and appreciating life's fundamental rewards. While technology and financial success have benefits when pursued in moderation, an insatiable desire for them leads to poor decision-making, harming others, and little gain in actual happiness. Smith criticizes gadget lovers who fill their lives with useless conveniences merely to signal status. And he notes that ambition and greed often motivate the pursuit of fame, fortune, and success more so than a desire to actually improve our lives. In summary, Smith suggests that to achieve wisdom and happiness, we must recognize our tendency toward self-deception and overcome an obsessive desire for more, better, and newer. We should pursue life's rewards and pleasures with moderation and balance, focusing on strong relationships and living fully in the present rather than believing happiness always lies just over the next horizon. A balanced and virtuous character is more valuable than lavish material goods, fame, or status. Adam Smith argues that we have an inclination to overly admire the rich and famous which distorts our view of them. 
For the famous themselves, the desire for attention becomes an insatiable need that destroys contentment and happiness. It is better to avoid ambition for its own sake and pursue meaning, virtue, and contentment rather than fame and wealth. There are two paths to gain respect and admiration, becoming rich, famous and powerful, or becoming wise and virtuous. The second path is better. Smith exemplified the virtuous path in his own life and advises us to seek wisdom and virtue to be happy. To be virtuous, follow propriety by meeting others' expectations, and actively do good for others through compassion and kindness. Propriety facilitates harmonious relationships. While impropriety gets attention, virtue and wisdom earn lasting respect. We generally approve of behavior that matches our own reactions. We are most sympathetic to those whose emotions harmonize with our own. Smith uses musical metaphors to explain how we adjust our emotions to match others. Perfect unison is impossible, but concordance provides enough harmony for society. Our ability to empathize depends on our closeness. We share strong emotions openly with close ones, but restrain expressions with others. The presence of even casual acquaintances calms us, though their empathy is imperfect. We sympathize more with great sorrows than small joys or complaints. Smith argues we sympathize more with joy than sorrow. We match friends' joy but struggle to sympathize fully with their grief. Our sympathy is limited. We share joy for sympathy but hide sorrow to avoid distressing others. We pursue wealth and avoid poverty to gain others' esteem. Smith observes how we interact in grief and joy, noting the limits of sympathy and propriety. Propriety allows sharing emotions at the right level for relationships. It gains approval and self-respect. Virtue, prudence, justice and beneficence, makes us loved. Prudence means caring for yourself. Justice means not harming others. Beneficence means helping others. Prudence includes health, money, reputation and relationships. The prudent man is sincere, honest, reserved, cautious, chooses friends carefully and avoids extremes. Justice means not harming others' life, liberty, estate, property or reputation. The just man is fair, fulfills promises and avoids deceit. Beneficence promotes others' happiness through kindness, generosity and suitable charity. These virtues lead to self-approbation, others' approbation and happiness. Overall, Smith argues for cultivating wisdom, virtue and meaning rather than chasing fame and riches. By meeting others' expectations, harmonizing with their emotions, and actively benefiting them through compassion, we gain their love and respect, which is the superior path to contentment. Emergent social phenomena arise spontaneously from human interactions, not by design. They emerge in a complex, unmanaged way through people's everyday behavior and choices. While any one person's actions have little impact, collectively our actions shape language, culture, morality, and society itself. There is an order and logic to these emergent social phenomena even though no one intentionally creates them. Adam Smith described this as the invisible hand. A better term is emergent order. Our individual self-interest and desire for approval interact to produce civilized society and moral behavior. We provide feedback through social interaction that reinforces virtue and discourages vice. This incentive system, combined with our innate moral sense, generates ethical standards and social norms. Laws and punishment are less effective than social approval and disapproval. Though unnoticed, the web of human relationships and judgments creates and shapes civilization. God gave us the role of approving and condemning others through interaction. We want to be around good people and avoid bad ones. Our choices in how we interact with and judge others determine behavior and values. Standards emerge from collective actions, so we should consider how the world would be if all behaved as we do. Individual acts combine to have impact. Most behavior depends on social norms, not laws. We risk disapproval, not legal punishment, for cruel acts. Social interaction promotes virtue, legislation cannot enforce it. In summary, emergent social phenomena show how individual actions have collective consequences and shape the world in subtle, unmanaged ways through relationships and feedback. Our morality and culture emerge from human action, not human design.
The key idea is that human society and ethics develop spontaneously through social interaction, not centralized control or individual orchestration. There is wisdom in the unmanaged web of relationships that generate emergent order. Our individual choices matter because together they create civilization itself. Human norms and behaviors emerge from many small interactions and feedback loops in society. While we try to encourage good behavior, radical changes often fail because they do not account for human nature. Incremental progress that works with human desires tends to be more successful. There are two contradictory human urges, to be autonomous and to control others. Imposing your vision on society often does not work and can make things worse. It is better to focus on living good lives and being compassionate rather than trying to solve problems through politics alone. In primitive societies, cooperation with those close by was necessary for survival. Today, prosperity depends on cooperation and exchange with strangers through markets. We rely on and benefit from strangers but still care most about those closest to us. Commercial life requires interacting with distant strangers, leading to self-interest. While trade with strangers creates wealth through specialization, we still have close relationships where we genuinely care for others. We have an urge to extend cooperative norms to the world but must accept the role of self-interest. Modern economies depend on impersonal exchange, but we see few of the people involved in providing what we use. We benefit from cooperation with distant strangers, or the market, though we cannot sympathize with them as we do with friends and family. There is a contrast between intimate and commercial spheres of life. We care for close others but dominate most economic transactions with self-interest, as limiting trade to only those we care about would make everyone poor. Yet we wish to extend caring norms beyond our circles. Leaders may exploit this. In summary, human nature encompasses both self-interest and caring for others. While radical changes fail if they ignore human desires, incremental progress through cooperation and compassion can improve society. A balance of autonomy and vision is needed, focusing first on living good lives. Markets create prosperity through impersonal exchange with strangers but do not replace close relationships where genuine care matters most. Here is a summary of the key ideas and examples from the book. Key Ideas Humans are prone to self-deception and narrative fallacies that can lead to poor decision-making. We desire to see ourselves in a flattering light and confirm our pre-existing beliefs. Humans act in self-interested ways but also have the capacity for beneficence towards others, especially those close to us. We should aim to expand our beneficence through impartial reflection. Social norms and rules emerge from human behavior and interactions. They depend on trust and shared values. Governments must govern with the consent of citizens. Justice depends on property rights and ensuring the sanctity of contracts. Theft and coercion should be avoided. Success, fame, and status are often pursued for their own sake rather than because they increase happiness. We should focus on living virtuous, meaningful lives surrounded by people we care about. Examples Finger loss versus Chinese catastrophe scenarios show how we weigh self-interest. Semmelweis's struggle shows the power of self-deception and narrative fallacies. Confirmation bias studies and podcast interviews show how we fall for self-deception. Pitt the Elder and Younger show how fame and status are pursued. Small behaviors like sharing successes show how we seek status and admiration. Religion, technology, drugs show how topics impact society and rules. Trading shows how specialization and productivity enable progress. Hume and Taleb warn against self-deception and scientism. Smith and contemporaries like Voltaire and Turgot lived during the Enlightenment. Thatcher and Reagan were leaders who shaped society and governance. Tyrants like Stalin show the dangers of coercion and disregard for property rights. Mentions of economists like Reed and Schumpeter place ideas in context. Mentions of people like Gore Vidal show the range of humanity. So in summary, the book explores how society and human behavior interact and depend on certain virtues and institutions. It aims to expand our understanding of beneficence and justice using examples and warnings from history and human nature. The key is promoting impartial reflection, limiting self-deception, 
and focusing on what really matters for individual and societal well-being.